Hello, and thank you for being with me. In this talk, I will assess the various dimensions of the Russian military campaign in Ukraine, which is nearing its second year now. I have been discussing Ukraine on television, in speeches, in articles, and in books for 17 years now. And those of you who are familiar with my words will know that my assessments, predictions, and warnings concerning Ukraine have been proven right. Unlike for politicians, journalists, and so-called experts in America and in Britain, whose lust for wealth, attention, status, and other lustful desires knows no limits, and who will use deceitful and other dark methods to satisfy their perverted desires, I intimately know Russia, her history, her people, her culture, her mindset, and her soul. Indeed, I have been studying Russia since the age of six. As one professional said about my first book, Arise Russia, The Return of Russia to World Politics, prophecies which have come true, especially regarding Ukraine. So, let me discuss now the current status of the war in Ukraine. Well, in military terms, and as I predicted from day one of the war, Russia is winning. In 2023, the Russian High Command implemented a strategy of defending through impregnable defences the lands which the Russian army captured in 2022, and in doing so, bleeding to death both the Ukrainian armed forces and its master, NATO. As a, as a consequence, the total losses of the Ukrainian armed forces to date are over one million men, killed, wounded, missing in action, and taken prisoner. While losses in armor, such as tanks, armored personnel carriers, and artillery systems amount to many thousands of pieces. Whilst Russian losses in men and equipment are significant, after all, the Russian military is essentially fighting NATO, including the bloc's de facto leader, America, Moscow's losses are a fraction of what the Ukrainian armed forces have incurred. I estimate, 50,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in action. Crucially, Russia can indefinitely continue to replace its losses. People should be aware that Russia can, if need be, mobilize close to 25 million men for military service, and that the Russian military industrial complex is a juggernaut and has been since the Second World War, and can and is outproducing the combined armament factories of NATO members. That reality is all the more startling when one considers that Russia has only used, so far, in Ukraine, between 10 and 15% of its overall capacity for war, according to my calculations. People should also be aware that the Russian military industrial complex since 1945 has been tasked with sustaining the Russian armed forces in a potential war with America. And regarding the American military, let me share with you an anecdote. In conversation with a retired senior American army officer, who is a friend of mine, he told me that, in regard to Russia's defense fortifications in Zaboroshi, which the Ukrainian army, as I predicted, so miserably and catastrophically failed to penetrate last year during its much vaunted counteroffensive, he would like to think that the American army would have penetrated the first line of Russian defenses 
but would have let but would have then floundered in attempting to breach the second line of Russian defenses. He added, however, that if Russia was fighting America, the Russians would deploy far more soldiers and equipment than what they are currently deploying against the Ukrainians. So, he said on that basis, the American military might not even be able to penetrate the first line of Russian defenses. The conclusion to be drawn from the words of my American army officer friend is this. If the US military, a superpower, would not succeed in breaking through the Russian defense fortifications in Zaboroshi, then anyone who says that the Ukrainian army can is either a paid useful idiot, and there are many, such as on CNN or Sky News or on The Times or on The Telegraph, or is an ignorant fool, or is deranged. In 2024, I, predicted, I, pr I predict the commencement of major Russian offensives, and perhaps simultaneously. As I previously predicted, the Russians, over the course of one and a half years, have mobilized approximately one million soldiers. Those men have now been trained and are ready to, and are ready to be deployed. And whilst some will be stationed behind the front line, serving in various capacities, many will be deployed for offensive actions. As I first began saying 17 years ago, the day will come when either all or most of the lands which comprise Ukraine will again be part of Russia. Now that the Russian army is in Ukraine, and now that the Russian army, the Russian economy, the Russian leadership, and the Russian people have withstood all that the West can throw at them, my prediction will come true. The eventual and irresistible advance of the Russian army westwards in Ukraine will see Russian soldiers capture the oblasts of Zhitomir and, Viz and Vinitsa meaning that, at the very least, three quarters of Ukraine will be absorbed by the Russian Federation. After the capture of Zhitomir and Vinitsa, this is where there is a question mark. As some of you may recollect, I have long pondered whether the Kremlin seeks the return of the westernmost regions of Ukraine, regions which, with the exception of Zakopatia, are overwhelmingly hostile to Russia, owing to how these regions, such as Lvov and ivano frankivsk were ruled by the Poles and the Austrians for centuries. And as a result, a lot of Polish and Austrian blood is in the veins of the populations there. Absorbing each and every oblast east and south of Zhitomir and Vinitsa, and including the two oblasts themselves, will provide Russia with the security which it so desperately requires against NATO. While in the Black Sea, Russian supremacy here will be absolute, as it was in the Soviet period and in the latter part of the Tsarist period. In cultural terms, Absor absorbing all of the aforementioned oblasts from Zhitomir to Kiev to Sumy to Kharkov to Odessa to Kirovgrad to Dnipri Petrovsk and so on will strengthen the Russian family or what is or what is historically known as the Russian world a, a concept which is actually which actually has its roots in the Tsarist period in the 19th century and not, as Western idiots say, in the Putin period. This leads to the inevitable question. Will the Russian army advance beyond Zhitomir and Vinitsa? I suspect that the answer is no, but I am not certain. 
One reason for my uncertainty is the oblast of Zakapatia, because here the population, largely speaking, looks upon Russia as a brotherly country. Capturing Zakapatia would enhance what is known as the Russian world and add depth to Russian defenses against NATO. But to capture Zakapatia would involve capturing either most or all of the westernmost part of Ukraine, and therein lies the problem. I suspect the Russian leadership of today is conscious of how the acquisition of the regions of Lvov, Ternopol, Rivni, Volin, and Ivano-Frankivsk by Stalin brought populations into the Soviet Union, which were troublesome and dangerous for Moscow. Does the Kremlin of today wish to have those territories in the new and enlarged Russian Federation that is currently taking shape? Again, I suspect not. Turning now to the Russian economy, as I predicted both before and after the start of the Russian military campaign in Ukraine, the Russian economy has withstood and triumphed over the West's sanctions on it, which number some 12,000 sanctions. Whilst the Russian economy has grown hugely in size through, in part, acquiring new markets and increasing its presence in markets already acquired, the economies of the West are sinking and are in recession as a result of the Western ruling elite's war with Russia, the lockdowns in the West, and the overall economic mishandling by the Western ruling elites. Though, of course, the Western ruling elites deny this via their media. If revolutions broke out in America, in Canada, and in Britain, for instance, the, the books would be opened and the true state of the American, Canadian and British economies laid bare for all to see. I strongly suspect the aforementioned economies are either on the verge of bankruptcy or are already bankrupt. Furthermore, Contrary to what the paid useful idiots of Western mainstream media predicted, the Russian army did not run out of weapons after two weeks. The Russian people did not overthrow their government. So-called climate change did not defeat Russian military planning. And the many so-called game changers did not turn out to be game changers at all on the battlefield in Ukraine. The paid useful idiots of Western mainstream media made those uncorroborated and laughable claims so as to justify the West's support to the Ukrainian government and to maintain public support for NATO's war against Russia. Assuming, of course, the American, the Canadian and the British publics supported NATO's actions in the first place. Let us not forget that polling companies in the West are, like the media, owned and operated by the Western ruling elites, who use them as weapons against, against both their own people and others in the world in pursuit of objectives be it the imposition of multiculturalism in Western societies, or the so-called creation of a new human biology, or to the demonization of any country which will not submit to the West. Suffice to say, the West is at war with everyone and everything in the world, including its own people, cultures, Christianity, and human biology. 
In, in concluding, the Kremlin will continue to prosecute its military campaign in Ukraine in accordance with how Russia historically makes war, which is very different to how the West makes war. And the Kremlin will take however long is required to reincorporate either most or all of the lands which form Ukraine. Nothing will dislodge the Russian army from Ukraine and nothing will prevent the Russian army from eventually capturing either most or all of Ukraine. The Russian people demand the return of what they describe as lost Russian lands. Putin wants to secure his place in Russian history as one of Russia's great state builders, along with Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and Joseph Stalin. So, I can only repeat my prediction, which I've been making for nearly two decades now. The day will come, and already has, when a new and enlarged Russia emerges. And this Russia will, in part, comprise lands in Ukraine, whose populations never wanted to be detached from Russia but were because of the criminal, treacherous, and unforgivable actions of Boris Yeltsin, Leonid Kravchuk, and Stanislav Shushkevich. Nothing can prevent the Russia of today from correcting the historical injustices brought about by Yeltsin, Kravchuk, and Shushkevich. Thank you for listening.